The sound of drums. The sound of bass. The sound of vocals. Is this the real life? The sound of guitar. Welcome to The Sound Of with Steve Black and Ann Carlini. And you and I talk concerts often. Yes. Of course, we talk music constantly. <laughs> Is there anything else? Artwork, a huge part of that. We've touched on it from time to time, but certainly not concert level artwork, like huge grand scale things. Yeah. This week, I invite uh, John Rios to join us. John, uh, first of all, has done my artwork for The Chop Shop and Classic Rock Live. He did the logo for this show, for The Sound Of. He did my book cover. Uh, so I've known John for a long time, man. Long Welcome time. in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And thank you for our logo, John. I yeah. love it. My pleasure. My pleasure. A lot of people don't notice on the circle that that's actual so- sound waves. Right, right, right. That, that turned out cool. I, I'm always proud of that when I see it online, you know? It's always a pleasure to see. So, <laughs> so you've worked with... A large number of artists. I'm going to go yeah. right to my favorite because I know it's one of yours, too. <laughs> yeah. But talk about what the thrill is like. I mean, you've been self-employed for 20 years. You've been doing artwork, you know, your whole life. And then at some point, somebody calls or emails you saying, are you interested in working for Alice Cooper? <laughs> <laughs> what is that like? It's like uh, uh, you feel like this cold sweat come <laughs> all of a sudden and you're like, holy crap, I get to do this. So, yeah, I mean, the first thing I uh, did with Alice uh was I had to recreate uh, an al- I think it was an album cover art actually the, the one where uh, it's kind of real stark uh, he's got the spider kind of makeup and oh yeah right and, and you have I don't know the name of the album or it's inside of the album or something I think it's an inside okay piece, yeah and you can see the band and the pupils and all that so I had to redraw that because that's a, a huge part of what I do is production art as opposed to creative um, but I it, a lot of times album art isn't ever made or designed big enough to print at 30 or 40 feet so a good chunk of what i do is recreate album art and uh uh, i just did some here just the other day for corn as a matter of fact for uh, uh, the 20th anniversary of uh, follow the leader i recreated that album but getting off track there uh uh yeah that's the first thing i did for alice and then it was i got to know what i take uh, typically do is get to know uh the tour people uh, the lighting director to tour manager, and I work uh, with those people. So the next thing I know I'm doing, you know, these tombstones for him uh, when he does, <laughs> you know, they're like 20 foot tall for, you know, Bowie and all these other artists that had passed away. And uh, and then I'm doing, uh, I, last year I got to do this, I think it's the coolest thing, I, one of the coolest things I've ever done for any band is his toy box. And as simple as it sounds, it's kind of this, baby pink and baby blue colors and stuff but i i uh now, is I, that the thing he puts on stage that he goes to throughout yes. the show and pulls weird things out of or he comes out of there he actually, uh, yeah that's true yeah. early on he does come out of the box right right so uh i actually was in i was in charge of designing this thing they they hey he had one back in the 70s and it's gone and so they sent me like these old gnarly photographs of it and said, well, recreate this artwork and come up with some new artwork for it. So what's really cool about it is when the toy box is open through the whole show and there's this teddy bear that I designed and it's got, you know, tape on it because it's been stabbed and he's got a sword and he's sure. flying through the air with balloons and all this. And that's that's 100 percent my design and concept even. And uh, I'm every time I see a photo of Alice <laughs> with that teddy bear, I'm like, I just grin like a little kid. So yeah. Alice uses a lot of illusion in his show. Yeah. You know, yeah. the most popular, of course, is the guillotine trick that he uses. So did you have to work with any of these people who create those yeah. illusions? Uh, yes. Uh, the company that uh, Alice use, uh, uses is called All Access. They're out in California. And they actually built this thing. And they're, they're actually, I have... I think it's cool. I have these little wooden swatches at the house. They had to FedEx me twice these wooden swatches with paint for that toy box. So we're going back and forth, and they're sending me photographs, and <laughs> nobody's trusting the photography. So I actually had to the the guy uh, David, who I work with, David Davidian. He was actually touring with Rihanna, so I had they had to FedEx me 
the the swatches for Alice, I got them the night before. Rihanna came to the palace, and I had to run down to the palace, and I'm sitting backstage with this guy, and we're proofing, you know, all this stuff for uh, Alice uh, at the backstage at the Rihanna concert. So it's it's kind of it's cool. I get to do some cool stuff. I mean, it was a lot of work, but it was it was it's a lot of fun too, you know. So it can be exciting backstage when you know you're kind of there to work. Right. To me, it was, uh, it, you know, going backstage to meet people, I always felt like I was in the way and, you know, but when you're back there and you actually have purpose, right. you know, and, and the crew's running around and, you know, people have certain cues they have to hit and it's just really an exciting feeling. It is. It, you know, I, I, uh, back in the day, I, my dad worked in a factory in Greenville, Michigan, and I, I go backstage anymore, and I'm thinking, my God, this is like the factory, you know, that my dad used to work at. Because these guys are backstage. There's, I don't know, 40, 50 guys, and you know, you you go back there, and there's you smell all the uh, uh, the aftermath of the pyro, and these guys sure. are hustling stuff, and you know, you have this fantasy of what backstage is. It's it's a factory back there. It's a well oiled machine, you know. So. Yep, a lot of boxes, a lot of crates, uh, of, forklifts, yeah, it's, moving things yeah. in and out, a little bit of forklift exhaust. Sometimes <laughs> if there's trucks and buses, there's that exhaust. Right. Sometimes. So, yeah, it's it's very, it's not what you would expect. <laughs> and, and it's a very serious machine because yeah. people can get hurt. Yes. Oh, sure. But, but not only that is that if if someone is uh, depending on you to be at a certain place, certain time for something, a pyro, whatever it may be, right. it has to go off. You know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, these people are very serious about their jobs. True. One of the cool pieces you did was was for Kid Rock. Yeah. You took his tattoo, right? The bird tattoo. It was an eagle, I think, from okay. his back and turned it into a 3D object. Well, I... I right? Am, am I close? Well, I was the... I took... I got a call from the staging guy. That's Gallagher Staging out in California. Great guys. I worked with them for many, many bands. And... Joe called me, who owns Gallagher, Joe Gallagher, and he asked me to, they had to have somebody uh, sculpt this thing out of foam. And nobody... This thing, what's the thing? I'm sorry, what you were just talking about, the eagle. The eagle. The eagle from the tattoo had to be sculpted out of foam so it could be... He hung it on the Born Free Tour. He hung it over the stage and he had it painted gold and all this. So he had me imagine what this thing looked like in 3D. So I did the old, I don't know if you ever took um, uh, like a class in school where you had to like architecture or whatever. So I had to imagine what this, so I'm pulling up photography of Eagles profiles and right. imagining what that would look like. So I actually sketched this thing in 3D overnight and which is usually the case. I got to have it now, but uh, uh yeah, so I, I actually drew this thing uh, in three dimensions. So the front, the back, the sides, so that somebody out in California could sculpt it. And, you know, to a scale, I think it was, I think it was 16 to 20 feet. I, I don't, I think it was about 16 feet wide, if I remember, wow. you know, I think. I, I, <laughs> All I, from a tattoo. <laughs> yeah, from a tattoo. Like <laughs> which is slightly so cool. bigger than the ta- the actual tattoo <laughs> yes. on uh, Bob Ritchie's back, which I think was done by Bob Tyrell, oh, a, right. another <laughs> Michigander. Yeah, very, very cool. popular tattoo artist. What, were you amazed when you saw the final product? Yeah, well, I, well, that I mean, that was the Born Free tour. So I did the that was my first uh, that was my first experience working with Kid Rock, and that was about his 40th birthday. So um, I actually did all the facade, the uh, uh, the wood treatment. It was the Born Free stage was a saloon. Yeah, it's very saloon looking. All yeah. Wooden. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think we went to that. Yeah, we went to the opening night, I think. Yeah, opening night in, in Saginaw. Saginaw. Right, right. Yeah, we went together. So uh, so anyway, and I had to, uh, there was this uh, uh, Longhorn steer head. Right. I had to do the renderings for that to, so that uh, they knew how to do the contour of the horn so it worked with the stage. And I did all the wood facade for that. And then also, within weeks of that was his 40th birthday, and I did the, that Ford Field event. Uh, the red, right. red, white, and blue uh, backdrop that was uh, uh, was used there. I, I designed that and actually went to his office. And he only had one critique. He wanted him, me to move a couple of letters, and he loved the design. And that's what they went with. The first thing I came up with. Now, so. most of the time, especially for an artist that isn't in Michigan, mm-hmm. um, all of this communication is going through email, maybe yes. an occasional phone call. Yep. But there has to be a ton of artists that you've worked with that you never even get to meet. Like here you are literally Most designing to their specifications <laughs> right. and, and 
never even meet them. No, that's, I mean, I've met a few. It's more likely that I uh, don't meet an artist, you know, but I've met a few. But yeah, most of the time I'm working with tour managers and lighting directors uh, and set designers. Uh, you know, I... Uh, that's who I, you know, communicate with because their, you know, their creative vision, they can think about it. They can sketch it out maybe loosely, but somebody has to take it from an idea to something physical that'll print or be produced to size. So that's most of, mostly what I do is take concepts and make them real. So who was the artist that was the most involved in, uh, involved? in the creative process? Oh, I worked... Uh, Involved, uh, I would say, I would say uh, I just, I've done the last two tours for a band called Ghost, and uh, I did their stage for the last two tours, and I actually, the way it works is, that's that's another Gallagher job, uh, and uh, uh, we we set up a conference call, and I actually speak with the lead singer, and um, and Joe's on the phone, and some other guys, you know, the tour manager, and we all sat on the phone for a half hour and go over every detail about what they want to do. Ghost is, I mean, the last two tours has super been super visual band, by the super way. visual. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm probably going to hell for the artwork. I, did. I was just, gonna, <laughs> I, I swear, I was just about to ask. <laughs> if you went to church afterwards, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little I, you know my for sure. <laughs> my arm did hurt for two weeks after it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's pretty crazy stuff. The what they like to do, I you know, but what I don't, I try not to, you know, judge anybody, and you know, whatever you want to do, I'll I'll try and accommodate. You know? Because uh, Ghost is uh, lead singers Tobias Forge, and they dress up as the uh, ghouls, right. but they're like in Catholic priest garb right and he used right. to be called papa emeritus, emeritus. Uh, yes yeah. and now he since has changed uh, to another character i think cardinal or i, I can't <laughs> remember what it was you got a promotion but, uh, yeah but yeah <laughs> so it, it is it, it is bizarre stuff so it doesn't surprise me that he'd want to be very involved oh, with the art every every detail i mean uh, the last one they're on tour with it now for a while is uh this this church and i did all this these marble columns and all these bricks with uh, sculpted heads at the top of the columns and all that the inside uh, the, and it's like three stained glass windows and somebody else did that but those were um video screens mm -hmm. and another job i got of course <laughs> of course is because see that's a lot of my work is people build artwork but they don't build it big enough to to print so right so after they go on tour for a while they decide well sometimes we don't want to have uh video screens at this particular venue so they came back to me with the uh with this art that's prepped for video which will not print at 30 feet so i had to repaint this all the stained glass windows and of course they're on tour so they need it immediately so i'm up right. till 3 30 in the morning for like a week straight actually it was about four days painting I think, these stained think glass of the windows. detail required to paint any object that is then going to be rendered to 30 feet tall yeah let alone stained I'm, glass i yeah, mean my <laughs> god john <laughs> the detail I mean. the details just got to be staggering it's well look at their if you see photographs of their new tour i mean i recreated those stained glass well i created the entire backdrop that is the church but then the stained glass windows as well uh i had to recreate it from somebody else's artwork so it had to match so nobody goes well that's different or weird it doesn't right, look yeah. right so yeah, so that's uh, that was a recent job. Was there any? Was there ever a time when somebody suggested something that was just too outrageous, <laughs> and, and you Did, had, and you had to say, uh, you no, know, let's let's rethink that. You know, that's funny you say that because uh, actually, a local guy. Uh, goes by the name of Ted Nugent. <laughs> I, I did see the album cover. I'm, I'm I have to say I'm shocked. I did see that album but, cover. Uh, yep. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, so I'm in my office and I start getting emails from Ted and he's like, okay, I want to do this, this, and this. And I'm, I'm laughing because as you usually do when you read Ted's emails. And so it was the, uh, it was, uh, it was an alternative album cover for Love Grenade. And uh, yeah, so, and if you've ever seen that, you can... That's another one. I'm probably going to hell, man. I uh, it's basically a lady tied with her hands and feet behind her back and an apple in her mouth served on a platter. 
So yeah, Very he much has like the, a roasted pig. Right. And, yeah. and and it's whatever it is. I mean, it is what it is. And his, needless to say, his manager made it so that we don't email e- any, each other anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, who am I to tell an artist, no, you can't do whatever you want to do. You know, I, I'm here, you know, I'm here to, you know, deliver the pizza that's you ordered. Here it is. You know, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> when they offer, order a pizza with live weapons, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> with, you know, with munitions on it. Right. That's my job. Don't make the pizza. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know. I, I just try not to, I don't try not to interfere with their creative process and their vision, you know? So whatever it is from ghost to Ted to whoever, you know? And uh, out of, uh, what is your favorite out of everything you've uh, seen, John? And I know there has to have been a ton. My favorite? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you, when you think back on, on your years, when you saw something and you went, wow, that, that's I, just something that w- will always be with you. Sure. I can tell you exactly. I mean, it's not the, it's not the, probably the most intricate or crazy piece of artwork, but the thing that made, um, the, the hair on the back of my neck stand up is when I looked at an email and it had the title kiss in it. And uh, so I read the email and, and I got to recreate the cats that are on the drum riser skirt for kiss. And that's the current version that they've used now for six years uh, or so, maybe seven now. Uh, but uh, what the deal was is that they wanted a new drum riser skirt for that with the, uh, for their tour with the cats uh, on it. And, um, Which people might remember from the when you opened up Kiss Alive Two, the album from Kiss Alive Two, the concert that they had. Those were the cats from the Kiss Alive Two era of touring. Right, that's the first time I ever saw them. Right, but the thing with that is that every time that happens, they're playing like Black Diamond or something. There's smoke and pyro and you know everything going on. So there's no really good reference to draw this, other than you know loose looking through smoke reference. So I had to do the best I could to get the cats right. And then the faces were sculpted, you know, at some point in time, they're, they're three dimensional faces. So the, the, the most original part of it is because when you're doing anything with a brand, that's as strong as kiss, you have to do it period. But the two things I would say that, uh, made mine different was that I actually had to come up with the faces and make those uh, my interpretation of what had been done before and before i did it those cats had never had stripes from now uh the tours that you see now for the last seven years uh the the stripes that uh the, the cats have stripes and the reason behind that what was happening was they were afraid that the gold fabric wouldn't droop right like it used to it, it had a kind of droopiness to it. it was like an applique type of thing so i was trying to come up with a way to draw this droopiness ended up drawing these stripes and they loved them and kept it so <laughs> <laughs> that's the backstory on that but yeah so i gave kisses cats their stripes i guess <laughs> you know it's just crazy like how many materials that, that you oh. have to incorporate because it's not just like drawing just on you know paper or you know a canvas right there's you have to think of uh, all these different textures well and that's yeah i actually the one of the the way I got into this is I did uh, a backdrop for Ted Nugent and the company out in California called So What Inc., who, who is like the industry standard for all things backdrop and all things show from anything from uh, the Super Bowl to the Grammys to any artist you could think of. They, I started working with them. They, they called me a year after I did Nugent's uh, backdrop, the first one, and wanted, they needed an artist for Crew Fest 2 which was like the first big production I ever worked on. And I did that whole 20th anniversary Dr. Feelgood Insane Asylum thing, and then they just started giving me work for, you know, uh, Rod Stewart, Billy Idol, uh, you name it. I've worked with like 40 bands now. And uh, so uh, that said, uh, So What works with all kinds of crazy fabrics and meshes and, uh, you know, depending on the 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 purpose of the 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 application, like uh, I did a stage for, uh, I did the set design for Eminem here a few years ago. I'd done a couple of them for him now, but one of them was a huge uh, jukebox. And uh, the deal was, is that we use this particular kind of mesh that if you hit it from the front with light, you see my rendering of this jukebox. But they had uh, the whole back behind the, uh, behind the jukebox is video wall. So when they turn on the video, 
the entire jukebox artwork disappears and all you see is the video. Mm. So, or and then that said also, like the speakers in the jukebox, we left those black and they just put video in, in the circles so that the, the nice. speakers look like they're pulsating and right. um, the, the the tape can look like it's spinning at times or whatever. So, right. yeah, so, you know, there's all this technical stuff and it all has to be in exactly the right spot and, you know, and that's one thing that... Uh, I so get. you're the reason my concert tickets are three hundred dollars. Yes, that's right. I'm the reason I can't afford to go to a concert. You know? That's crazy, you know. But it, it, it's nuts because in this era of CGI and all this highly technical, this big, you know, this world that we live in, and what we've seen on stage with the lights is that it's still good to know that there is someone with a paintbrush still creating. Right. That's yeah. Literally, uh, yeah. I mean, I do mine digitally so that I, I hand paint digitally. So it's all, you know, I don't use anything canned or anything like that, but it's all, you know. And, and, and sometimes what I create digitally is people out in California will take what I've done. Like for Rod Stewart, I did this 120-foot backdrop for him. Actually, it's like the, for the intro of the, of the show, and it's this big uh, soul train-looking train. And somebody took exactly what I did and repainted it by hand for him. So, wow, amazing. Yeah. Wow, what a life you've had, John. I've, I've had some fun. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the sound of sound of. The Sound of's weekly top seven lists. Here are Ann Carlini and Steve Black's selections from seven to one. <laughs> So having had John Rios on and, and John continuing with us on to this segment as well, I thought it'd be fun and for you and I to do our top seven album covers. And there has been a huge resurgence in vinyl. So I'm assuming that we're just not talking to uh, old people like you and I, Steve, who grew up with albums, that the millennials, you know, they don't call them albums or records anymore. They call them vinyl. Yeah. You know, they, that uh, they will recognize some of these albums that we're talking about, you know, because they, they're falling in love with the album covers like we did. There was a reason why we missed records when they went away and now they're coming back. And much like when we talk about music, most of my album covers are, are of the older variety. And it's not because the new ones aren't good. It's because they didn't connect with me when I was 12. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> you know I mean? that's the way because right. I there was an album cover on here and I thought, wow, I'm not even sure if it was the music. It was just the album cover that really got to me yep and and i had to really i kind of struggled with that with this list so we'll, we'll start at our number sevens and uh mr rios yeah. being the resident artist you can kind <laughs> of uh critique our picks if you will i'll be happy to all right uh i actually have i could not get down to i couldn't do it i was so i came up with two at seven is oh, that you're such a cheat huh. I, I I had to All do right. two honorable mentions because I couldn't fit in I got seven. 14 honorable <laughs> mentions. <laughs> All right, so All what's right. your tie at, at my, seven? My tie at seven is Kiss Destroyer and Boston, Boston. Boston, Boston. Now, the Kiss Boston Destroyer. album cover, which is the, the guitar-shaped spaceships, which, right. by the way, in the original artwork, they were attacking the Earth, but the band said, no, that's we want it saving. So that's why you see the city up top. So it's like, hey, look, these cities were saved by spaceships. Um, so that that was kind of cool. Although the artist insists that that's just mediocre artwork. He's never liked the album. Really? <laughs> for himself, even though it's his most famous painting. Uh, and then the Kiss Destroyer album. I thought this was funny. And, and John, you might uh, appreciate this. The original art, uh, the background was black. And the costumes of the band, this was a painting on the Destroyer album for people who don't know it. They were wearing the Kiss Alive costumes. Right. The Kiss hadn't changed their costumes yet, or the public didn't know about it yet. So then they saw the artwork, and apparently this guy did that album cover in exchange for tickets and backstage passes. <gasps> Get out of here. That sounds like something I'd do. Yeah. <laughs> But it did lead to him getting the contract to do their next album, Love Gun, which he got paid for. Thank God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, what's so weird about that Boston album is because here's a band coming out named Boston. It's like nothing to do with the town. It, 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 it was totally irrelevant. I mean, right. the, the spaceship. I mean, even though like at the beginning of, you know, long play or a uh, long time. Are you talking about play, just another it, band out of Boston? No, no. What's the first song on that Boston album? 
uh, uh, four more than play. a feeling. Yeah. It, yeah, more than a feeling. First it, it, this sounds like a spaceship taking off. Oh yeah, yeah, you know. Right. Yeah, so I, part. But, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it was just it was. It, but after you got to hear the music, it just didn't. It just becomes the Boston album. Yeah, you know. But I do love that Kiss Destroyer uh, artwork. artwork. I, I do. do. Too. Yeah, Ken Kelly was the artist's name. Nice. Not that. I was looking or anything, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. He he later did he did a piece for Ace Freely a couple of years ago too. Nice. Yep. By the way. Nice. So my number seven was uh, Houses of the Holy for oh, Led Zeppelin. Nice. And it took him like uh, ten days to shoot that. Now is that a painted photograph? I always thought I knew it was a photograph, but it looks like it was also painted. Does anybody know? I I don't know the back in it, but it is enhanced somehow. It is, and it's it's actually two children uh, crawling up a, a causeway in uh, Northern Ireland, but it took them a long time to shoot it. And then, yeah, they, then they enhanced it. But you know, at first I didn't like that album cover. It was kind of disturbing. It was kind of weird to see two naked, you know, small children, you know, climbing up a hill, you know, and all you saw were their backsides, but it was just so different. But, uh, but then the older I got, the more I, I just really loved it. I love the colors and I love the whole concept of it, you know? So yeah, so that, that came in my number seven. You know, and some some people, like uh, they didn't even want to sell that album. They thought it was to have naked children on there. They didn't even want it in the store. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's happened on more than one album cover yeah, oh, where yeah. they didn't want it in the store. <laughs> yes, and I think a few of them are on my list. Anyway, <laughs> number six for me, the backstory, which is kind of interesting. the The person who painted it died a year later. Whoa. And he was just 24 years old. Really? So it was the only album cover he ever painted. He died in 1970. The album came out in 1969. King Crimson's in the courts of the Crimson King. Oh, wow. Nice. Oh, I didn't realize that, that, that artist passed away. Wow. Yeah, but very early, like right after the album came out. Yeah. Is that the... Is that the face? Yeah, it's kind of the screaming face. Face, yeah. And then you could, when you open the gatefold, the, uh-huh. the, it was extended... Like that photo was extended onto the back of the album as well. Very cool. Always been a fan of that photo. I, I suspect not everybody knows that one. So if you're listening and, and you don't know it, by all means, Google. And, th- and, th- and this is why art is subjective, because that picture was always so disturbing to me. I never liked it. <laughs> It was just like that's probably that why screaming I liked it. Fa- yeah, exactly. The screaming face with the red and, yep. you know, coming down on one side. It was just, it was too much. That was disturbing. <laughs> See, now my number six is, is a nice album cover, Steve. Aww. It's Candy O by the Cars. Oh, oh that was nice. Yes. And uh, that's uh, an Al- Alberto Vargas. That's a yes. Vargas. And uh, I liked it because like the, the uh, car was kind of like a sketch. Right. And then the woman laying on the uh, hood of the car was fully painted. And she was kind of like that. in a one piece I, with I, high heels. I liked it too because the, that one piece was more or less see through. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus points for see through. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point in time in the 70s. Uh, yes. That's yeah. what you were looking for. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. Hey, yeah. that was reason enough to buy the record back then. Yeah, and the, and the background is white. Yeah, it, I remember that. It, it was... actually is quite classy. Yes. You know, even though we're describing it in a way that maybe doesn't sound as much it is it's a very classy album cover agreed. i think agreed it's beautiful mm-hmm. all right five for me is going to be a deep one that not everybody knows but it's gorgeous it's such a gorgeous one uh, sabotage gutter ballet picture an old theater an old you know film or state theater type of place there's a piano in it the curtains are everywhere is know, this a the, photo or a, a drawing it's a drawing it's a painting okay oh, wow. um Grand piano in the lobby, a guitar sticking through the hood of the piano, like the top of it, like something violent happened here, but it's an abandoned theater. And then a gorgeous ballerina ghost, not a real person, but a see-through ballerina standing next to the piano. And then as you look into the details of the album cover, you see the ghost of Beethoven back there and a few other faces in interesting places. So it's got that whole, the ghosts haunting this old theater thing. And it's, it's just a gorgeous album cover. Sounds amazing. I haven't yeah. seen that, but I, I'm going to look that up. Yeah. Wow. Is it, uh, co- and so some of it's in color? It's oh, it's all, all in color. color yeah. But I imagine it's dark, though. Uh, no, it's more reddish. Okay. Yeah, the red is the dominant color of the album mm-hmm. cover. Red and gold. Wow, what a neat concept. Yeah, it's really cool. Worth looking up. Wow. 
And uh, number uh, five for me is uh, David Bowie, Diamond Dogs. Love that one. Love that one. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when they talk about Bowie's album covers, they always go to Aladdin Sane. Uh, yeah, immediately. You know, yeah. with the, the picture of him with the uh, face paint yep, across. The uh, lightning yeah. The bolt lightning across bolt. the eye. Yep. Yep. Uh, but Diamond Dogs, to me, was like, it was when you looked at that album cover, you just didn't know what to think. Right. You know, he they he was uh you know, you could see clearly David Bowie's face. Right. But it was on the image of a dog, you know, where he had his paws crossed. Right. And these like weird, like demon like people behind him. But it was like when you saw that album cover, it's like, what is this? <laughs> I always thought that was a super underrated song, not that we're talking about that right now. But of the Bowie songs, it's a super underrated song. I've always liked Diamond Dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just thought it was just one of the most complex and interesting album covers I'd ever seen. Yeah, I love that one. Number four for me deals mm-hmm. with my love of classic things. Mm-hmm. Alice Cooper's Greatest Hits. Uh, is this the one where he's coming out? Nope. This is, is the that- one where they are dressed in 1930s garb. <laughs> And it's all sepia tone, so it's kind of, you know, that, that grayish mm-hmm. color. It's another gatefold where you open it up and it expands, but it's the band sitting on the hood or fender of a car Oh yeah, with everybody from that period also drawn. This is a drawing. Groucho Marx is in the picture, Peter Lorre, uh, Gene Harlow, Clark Gable, uh, Humphrey Bogart, and they're all just kind of in this 1930s uh, sort of gangster-looking piece. And it's, it's actually, I actually own a reprint of the artwork and it's framed and it's in my bedroom. Like it's a huge wow. <laughs> like framed behind glass piece. That's how much I like the artwork. That sounds yeah. so much like Alice though, you know, his love of old time movie stars. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm trying to think of, I don't think I've seen it. I must have seen, I must have oh, seen must it somewhere. Have. Uh, anyone who was my age when they got that album cover had to like figure out who all the people were. Like, I've seen, well, that's Groucho Marx, but who's mm-hmm. that? Oh, that must be. And then your parents come and help you. Oh, well, that's Clark Gable, son. That's Clark Gable. Don't you know Clark Gable? Like, you know. Peter Lorre. That's Peter Lorre. Oh, I should have known that. <laughs> you know. Almost like a Sergeant Pepper thing. Yeah, very much so. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, number four for me is another one of those Naked Lady uh, album covers. Uh, it's a It's Roxy Music. Country life. I don't know this one. Uh, if you saw, if you saw it, it, you would remember it immediately because it's two women, and uh, they both have like see-through uh, bra and panties on, and one's covering her top, and the other one's covering between her legs, and it's just like they're kind of like looking out of nowhere, and the background is kind of like leafy, but I. I I don't know why I just gravitated toward that album cover. I just thought it was an interesting picture and uh it was shocking in a way it was kind of like right on the borderline right on the borderline of being too much Mm. you know where it was sexy you know and revealing but it was a really i I just thought it was uh i thought it was a really edgy album cover and really edgy picture and i liked it i have to look that one up too that that's a sounds like it has all the elements of a great album. Greatness, cover. yeah. You, know? you had me and two women. <laughs> yeah, co- okay. Country life. Look it up. <laughs> you guys will love it. Uh, number three for me is a photograph, but the person who set up the photograph and put all of this together and designed it, and it was probably a team of people. Super cool. Are either of you familiar with the Rush live album Exit Stage Left? Yes. Yes. Familiar with the artwork? Yes. So at this point in time, Rush had eight studio albums out. So the live album was going to be live versions of songs from those eight albums. They incorporated all eight of their album's artwork into the live album album cover. Right. So like the lady from the black and white album uh, Permanent Waves is backstage holding the curtain looking out onto the stage. The owl from Fly By Night is above her. Uh, right. the, the guy in the suit and tie from Hemispheres is in the background. The, uh, the circle with the star in it is on a poster on the wall backstage. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on. Every album cover is represented. Wow. Uh, it, I just thought that was beautiful the way they came up with that. I, I think Russia always did a great job with their album covers. Yeah. I, I, I really do. And I, I really think in their last tour, uh, I think they did an awesome job with giving the fans a little bit 
from each decade of their career. Yeah. You know, I don't think any Rush fan walked out of there not satisfied, you know, by what they heard and what they saw. But yeah, they they really know how to uh, embrace their their, their past. career, their past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's and that's just paying that's paying homage to the fans. Yeah. It is. You know, so yeah, yeah I, I Rush definitely some awesome album covers for sure. Number uh, three for me is uh, Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA. Oh. And it's probably one of the only, like I, st- I purposely left off all photographs of bands just to kind of, you know, get it down to seven. And the reason I like Born in the USA was because it's said so much about Bruce Springsteen's persona and about what was on that album. So if you remember, it's the flag, and he's standing in front of it in jeans, and he's got that red uh, handkerchief coming out of his back pocket. And they asked him why they took a picture of his ass, and he said, well, because it looked better than my face. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> to me, it will always remain one of the most iconic album covers, especially in America, because I don't think any there was no other picture that could have wrapped up more of his persona and that music that was on that album. I give you iconic. I mean, as soon as you said it, I knew exactly oh, yeah. what you were talking about. Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Number two for me is every album Iron Maiden ever made. <laughs> <laughs> see this, see this, John? Do you see what no, I got to put I up did, with here? I, <laughs> I narrowed it. <laughs> narrowed it down to 20. I, <laughs> I actually went with Power Slave. Uh, okay. It's hard to pick one Iron Maiden album. Well, they're all really... Eddie. I know. They're all Eddie, Steve. And they're all They're all awesome. just versions of Eddie. <laughs> but they're all awesome. <laughs> I love Eddie. Uh... Power Slave, as I'm pointing at John Rios here, okay. because he does work in extremely large, you know, 30 feet tall things. Right. If you go over the Power Slave album cover with a magnifying glass you will find things in there that you just would never have dreamed of because you're looking at a pyramid and a uh, um a pharaoh right and it's and it's huge size like and all kinds of tiny little people walking in and out of this pyramid and stuff so the artist did all kinds of interesting things in the hieroglyphics there's a drawing of mickey mouse ah nice and another segment uh there's a little piece where it says Indiana Jones was here and it's signed 1941. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, bullocks. The word bullocks is scribed into one of the headings, but you can't see it. It just looks like hieroglyphics. Wow. You really have to examine it to find all the little details. So someone really had fun with it. So, yeah, for sure. That's and the best, man. So hiding things in art. I love that. Yeah. So I figured since it's hard to narrow down any one Iron Maiden, I would go with that one because it had the little cute things in it. All right. Well, number two for me is simple. Uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Super Uh, simple. The Prism. Yep. And I can't even tell you why. I just love it so much. It must be. And I really am torn because I know I'm emotionally invested into that music. And I know I held that album not once, but twice I had to buy two uh, you know, two albums because I wore the first one out. So I just don't know. It's almost like, it's almost like uh, the album cover of Dark Side of the Moon is almost like a family photo. <laughs> it's like I have held it and looked at it so much and seen it in my lifetime that I, I just, when I thought when you came to me and said we're going to do our top seven album covers, it was the first one that came to mind. I had a bunch of Pink Floyd on my list and ended up not keeping any of it. Yeah. It, it just, it, uh, it's iconic and it's memorable, but it's not like something that I would hang on my wall, I guess. That's, see, and that prism is like, it, to me, that's my favorite. The other Pink Floyd albums, I hate their, uh, I hate their art. Really? I like animals a lot. I, that old nasty just, factory with a pig I floating know, over it. I know, it's just so goofy though. It's so goofy <laughs> and it's so dumb. It's like, here, okay, it's a cow. Okay, well, and? <laughs> and you know, I to me, but it was like the prism was just like so simple, and you know, I, I don't you didn't know. Like the I guy on really fire shaking no, hands with the I guy who was like not the on guy fire. On fire no. <laughs> it was just too weird. Well, I'm not even asking about Adam Hart, mother. <laughs> Forget that. Uh, All right, number one for me was originally on Astounding Science Fiction Magazine. It was the cover in 1953. The band asked the artist if he would recreate it, 
and take out the dead guy and replace him with members of the band. Oh. So he did. Queen, News of the World. Oh. Really? Giant robot. Holding dead members of Queen. In fact, one of them's got a hole in his chest from where the robot right. stuck his finger in his chest, and the robot's got blood on his finger. Mm-hmm. But yeah, giant robot killing the band Queen. Oh my God, I-, I love Queen, and that is my least favorite album cover. That's my <laughs> far my favorite, my number one. Wow. I re- I remember the first time I saw that and just went wow. It was so different than anything they had done. Yeah, true. Because you know they use the icon, you know the Queen logo on uh, night at the or not at the opera and or day at the races. Day at the races, yep. you know. So I mean, it, that's what you expected to see right. for the next album. And then all of a sudden, the robot. It was like, what? <laughs> what is this? But it was the reason I bought that Queen album was mm-hmm. the artwork. Sure. I saw that and went, oh, I gotta have this. Oh, must yeah. have. Must have. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> must have, must have. <laughs> <laughs> well, number one for me um, is Led Zeppelin one. Interesting. Yeah, and I and I think it's just because you know that uh, whole picture of the Zeppelin going down right. and tying it and and just saying, "This is Led Zeppelin. Here we are. Get ready." They just had they they didn't. Uh, you know, Nick's words, it was like, this is us. You know, yes, we're a Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it's crashing and burning. And I just, you know, looked at that album cover and it's like, wow, man, could not wait to put it on, you know, to see what this was all about. So to me, it was like it was it was the perfect album cover to get you interested and to state what the band was all about. A first one. Very first wow. album right out of the gate. Is there anything on our list that surprised you, John? Uh, as far as, uh, I wouldn't know. No, not really. I mean, they're all great albums. You know what? I'm sitting here listening to you talk, and the thing that uh, is I'm, I'm, the commonality of it is they're all thought-provoking. They all ask questions. You know, a one visual image just leaves all these questions, and that's a real common thread between all of them if it's a painting or a photograph or whatever they're all really thought-provoking you know so i I love that i love your choices some of some of them are my favorites too you Mm -hmm. know so uh yeah great great list guys mine so so i have i'm gonna let you give Mm -hmm. two honorable mentions two got it oh you want me to start (laughs) (laughs) well I'll, I'll, i'll give you mine okay go ahead judas priest british steel yep where they're holding the razor blade, razor blade, yeah, in their hand, and it says British Steel. I just think that's awesome. I love that they tied that in. And uh, Van Halen, 1984, where it's the baby angel, yeah. and he's stealing a smoke, and that he's is... kind of like his eyes are like looking off to the side. I love that one. I I do like that one, but I thought that that was borrowed a little bit from Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, which was oh. all the angel smoking on oh, the black maybe. album cover. Ah. I mean, theirs was a baby angel versus theirs were adult angels. But I don't know that. I, I love both of those album covers, by the way. But mm-hmm. I always think of Black the Sabbath. Black Sabbath one. had yeah. some awesome album covers. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my two honorable mentions uh, Disturbed, 10,000 Fists. Okay. It's got their creepy little demon guy, but it's, it's a painted crowd. Instead of a photograph of a crowd, it's, it's just a painting. And it's, uh, I, I really like it. it. It is thought-provoking, to use John's words. The other one I'm going to go with is Pearl Jam 10. It's just all, it's the hands of the band all united together. And I, every time I see that, I feel the image it gives me is triumph. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, we may be new, we may be just showing up, but we will not be stopped. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting when you, because it, the one thing that you don't get when you stream music is you don't get to see the creativity of the band. And just right. that's those, like you just talked about Pearl Jam. It's like that, those are the things that you bond with a band over if, if you want to even take it there. It's like you go, wow, man, I really love this band. But now you get a little piece of what's going on behind the scenes, you know, more so than the music. You know, because, because the album covers, you know, they have a lot of input. Some of them really, you know, they desire, it goes past the videos. Right. You know, this is an image that's going to be forever out there. So they put a, some of them put a lot of thought into it. I, I think I'd, I'm, I'm glad we had this conversation. I'm, I'm sitting here realizing how much those 
album covers really influenced what I do. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, because I... I'm just remembering how I felt now that you're saying all these album covers back to, you know, that Queen album, my God, and, and, you know, Destroyer and Boston's first album. I mean, these are albums that were, I mean, when I was a kid, that was, you just, you just stare at this stuff. Right. And you, and back then there was no MTV. So, you know, this is, this is your visual of the band. So I don't know. I love that. And it was so exciting, especially when you got to open up an album and they had maybe the lyrics inside or they had pictures it was like an extra it was like a bonus and then even sometimes you'd pull out pictures where the record was and they'd have another picture of the band you know it was really important to us because that was our only connection to them you know but uh but i'm so excited to see vinyl coming back and uh, uh people being able and and bands being able to express themselves in this way once again this 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 is the, the sound of the sound of. We're gonna take a little break, so uh, don't nobody go nowhere. The sound of the 70s. The sound of the 80s. The sound of the 90s. And the sound of today. This is the sound of with Steve Black and Ann Carlini. So in the news uh, is one of... Wait, wait, uh, Ann, wait. Yes? What? Tell me one thing. What? Yes. How does this beard line up look? I'm butter, right? <laughs> You're butter? I'm butter. Does that mean your beard means yellow? you have a perfectly lined... I'm butter. I'm butter, man. smooth? Wait a second, wait a second. Is that what that means? <laughs> I don't have yes. lines in my butter. My butter has no lines in it. <laughs> Carry on in. I'm sorry for interrupting. All right. So, <laughs> Rev, I purposely picked this story because I know you're a big Greta Van Fleet yes. uh, fan. So what they've done is something interesting. You know, the band is is on tour right now, and uh, they're just about – well, they, they released their album, Anthem of the Peaceful Army, but they're – done something a little bit different something i haven't seen before so they're inviting fans to take a walk in nature and listen to one of their songs and they've actually launched an app to help you do this (laughs) really yeah sounds like such a hippie (laughs) thing it it does and then you throw app in it (laughs) have you seen the lead singer (laughs) fair fair i mean yeah i mean he is about as hippie as it comes i don't care if he's uh, 21 or not. Yeah. One of the things I like about them is that they do sort of embrace that era. Mm. And they, they're they starting to talk more and more about it, you know, as they get out there yeah. and they have to do the interviews and well, and all the uh, comparisons to Led Zeppelin. Anthem of the Peaceful Army. I mean, yes. that's as, as hippie as you get. Well, the name of this song <laughs> is Age of Man. Dig that, <laughs> man. Age of Man. <laughs> so the guys announced that they've designed an app and uh, users are guided to local parks to enjoy this uh, epic track. So what they want you to do is they want you to uh, put it in your ears and then take a walk through nature, and they'll be your soundtrack. With or without assistance from legal marijuana. <laughs> I believe that's up to you. <laughs> and, and the voters. <laughs> yes, it's up to the voters first. Yes. Yeah, when you say wilderness, I'm thinking you're... Talking like in the woods somewhere, yeah. But yeah, you're, take, you're take meaning, or you mean just like I nah, see? I can't do that. They said that if you uh, if you share your location on the app, they'll help you find the nearest park to listen to it in. Oh, okay. Yeah, well. so that's pretty nice. And then fans are encouraged to take photos of their surroundings. So, and then you know, I'm sure that they want to post some of that. It's called uh, it's called the White Rose March. White Rose yes. March. I know. No, hippie, no hippie, hippie, hippie. Uh, elements there at all. No. Sheesh. Wow. Uh, let me just say, I don't plan on doing this. <laughs> we should do it together, Steve. We, we seriously that should. That would be so butter. Did you just say, what, listen, take the E and the R off and replace it with the A. <laughs> me and Rev are going to walk in nature. <laughs> Well, you know, we live in uh, the great state of Michigan, so it's a little bit chilly right yeah, now. Yeah, it is and, chilly. And it is really beautiful. This is my weather, though. Some of the so. national parks. Yeah. yeah. Just gorgeous. But, you know, I mean. I, I just, might do that. I might do it. In some places. Just to it, share it with you guys and let you know how it was. I, I do love to listen to music out in nature, though. I mean, I've done that many times, so I get where they're coming from. You know, I just got back from Nevada, and I have to tell you, so I really enjoyed silence. 
And when they say silence is deafening, it mm-hmm. can be. Wait a minute, where is silence at in Nevada? Oh my God! Southern get out! Nevada. Get out into the desert. Just drive one hour desert. outside of Las uh, Vegas. It so let's is see. You don't do stunning. deserts. You don't do the outside. Well, you how don't are you going to get to the desert? First you don't of all, don't do ships. No, man. I'm lame. I think you'd like the <laughs> desert. <laughs> I'm lame. <laughs> man, they got sand worms out there or whatever. What? Sand the sand worms. You know, like the ones they had on Beetlejuice. Oh my! Oh, Those God. exist. I'm sure go they do. Dune. <laughs> or or a dune. We're yes. breaking out a dune reference. That's so butter. <laughs> Stop I, saying butter, all right? Uh, You're the one brought it up. I said butter. 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 Life is not a sci fi movie, Rev. No, well. No, because Steve and I have tested out those theories, and none of them <laughs> help. True. None of them. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at uh, two of the biggest nerds on the planet. Believe me. That sand's hot, so, though. If. We we live for the day when Star Trek is a reality, please. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. So, uh, Rev, are you familiar with a guy named Jake E. Lee? I am not, actually. So, Jake E. Lee um, is, uh, was one of the guitar players for Ozzy. Did two oh, albums okay. with Ozzy. Uh, okay. Two of his most popular albums. He was with him from uh, 1983 to 1987. So, uh, they, uh, it was The Ultimate Sin and Bark at the Moon. Yes, so after those two albums, uh, he had a dispute over royalties. And writing credits. And writing credits. Mm-hmm. And so he left the band. Okay. Then. So, uh, you know, uh, he said that's really all he wanted was just credit for what he said that he right. wrote on those two albums. Right. Uh, negotiating with Sharon <laughs> it's, it's not something I would wish on my worst enemy. <laughs> uh, it has to be a living hell. So do you know if he ever got, did he win? I don't believe so. No? I don't believe he got the, well, here's the thing for those of you who've never written a song. It's almost impossible to prove what you wrote and what somebody else wrote. Okay. You bring in an idea and that inspires something else. Well, what was the writing part? The idea that inspired or what it became? You know, it's so it's really hard. You have to agree to it basically the day the song and is And then it's written. all about pat- patenting it too, right? I mean, the old school method, method is you write a song and then you mail it to yourself. That's what I heard to do. Right, but what if you co-wrote it with somebody? This is where we're getting into. Yeah, this is where this Ozzy situation came up. Four or five people are in the room as the song comes together. And then if one or two people take credit for it, so do the other people get writing credit? So, so Ozzy's pretty much like, no, you had no parts of this? Or limited, very limited. So you could say, okay, uh, we wrote a song together, but you get 10% of it, I get 90 Right, right. And if you're employed by that person, you might go, hmm, all right, I don't really agree, but I do want to keep my job. Right, right. <laughs> I, I see it. So, I mean, Ooh. I don't know. I wasn't in the room, so on this particular case, I don't know. But I know what Jake's playing sounds like, and I he probably wrote a little bit more than he got credit for. Sorry, and to detour. Well, uh, fast forward to 2014. So uh, he knows one of the producers that's working with Ozzy, and the producer calls Jakey e. Lee and says, hey, you know, I'm working with Ozzy, and what would, what would you think about maybe coming back and doing a couple of tunes with him? You know, and he said, well, I really hadn't thought about it. You know, he was still kind of bitter over the whole, uh, you know, non-writing credit thing. And so uh, he said, I don't know. I've, I've really got to think about it. And he said the talks basically went nowhere. Right. So when he heard that Ozzy was going to go on his final tour, uh, the No More Tours. Part two. Part two. Mm-hmm. He thought, wow, you know, it might be kind of cool to be a part of this and just get on stage and do the songs, a couple of songs off Bark at the Moon and The Ultimate Sin, the stuff that Jakey Lee played on. Right. And so he reached out to the band and uh, basically got crickets. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) He said, uh, the offer's out there, but was not responded to. Uh, So apparently there are still some hard He should have jumped on that ship when he was first asked. I'm going to take a guess. My guess is Ozzy and the producer said, hey, here's an idea. What if we bring Jake in to do it? And Ozzy went, oh, yeah, I know we should do that. Right? (laughs) He does a great Ozzy. Right? (laughs) Then when Jake got serious about it, oh, maybe I should tour. Hey, that's a good idea. Well, now Sharon gets involved. 
<laughs> could be, though. It could be. <laughs> probably had nothing to do with Ozzy. It was probably Sharon going, what? Pay two guitar players? Are you kidding me? No. Wait, doesn't he still want writing credit on a song? <laughs> no. <laughs> Ozzy, no. <laughs> and there was your crickets. Uh, wow. <laughs> That's so. it. It's crazy what happened to Ozzy, though. You know, I, I just heard that he didn't have one staff infection three uh, right he had three, three. Oh, jesus yeah three staff infections in his hand and uh when he saw the doctor uh because he said his hand blew up basically the size of a light bulb he had just had surgery on his on his thumb or they something had to remove that, part of the infection it was that bad it was that bad and uh so the doctor asked him he says well you know what have you been it's crazy that doctor would ask Ozzy like what have you been doing you know have you been in contact with people shaking hands he goes well yeah I just got back from a meet and greet I shake hands all the time with you know how many people see yeah, him right you know they because now they charge this outrageous amount of money mm. to go backstage and meet these rock stars and they expect to touch Ozzy yeah and have a picture with him so here he is he's got a wound on his hand right you know I, a small cut just a small it cut hang nail yeah, and all of a sudden, uh, he's out there touching all these strangers in right? how many different cities, and then he wonders how we ended up with three different infections? Yeah. Mm. So I don't know what they're going to do about this meet and greets. It must go, might go back to, ah, don't touch. Yeah, I've you know, been to we'll a take couple a picture, of those. I don't love them. No. Wow. I mean, I understand. Don't get me wrong. I understand. First of all, meet and greets should be much smaller. <laughs> there shouldn't be 300 people that. at a meet and greet. I agree with that. That's first of all. But... Um, yeah, I've been to a couple. I think I told you about the Van Halen one where you're not allowed to shake hands with Eddie. Mm, no. Yeah, somebody somewhere along the line, you know, hey, I'm Mr. Firm Handshake Guy and, you know, kind of injured his hand a little bit. And that's his whole career is playing guitar. So that yeah. was the end of that for every meet and greet after you're not allowed to touch Eddie's hands. Yeah, I so, feel... So, I mean, I get it, but I don't love it. I, I don't like him either. And I feel like not only are you rushed, but then I start to feel sympathy for yeah. the person who is standing there, whoever the star is, you know, and how many people putting their arms around them, getting close to them, snap, snap, hi, how are you? And it's now an assembly line yeah. where it used to be where they would bring them out and you kind of mulled around and yeah. people would talk. And then it was kind of, you had to wait for your moment to That's kind of walk up and go, hi, hi. I'm Ann, and, you know, I really enjoy blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, I'm but it's sure not all like his, that anymore. All, all these artists out there, I'm sure they know that their fans, that's exactly what their fans want to do. They want to touch them. They want to get close to them and have that memory, like, you know, go home and like, oh, I got to touch freaking Ozzy or whatever, you know. So I, I'm sure they know this, and it's like, I don't know, just to not do it, I don't know. I'm kind of against it. I think you should do it. Just carry some sanitizer on you. I tell you, I, I'd almost rather somebody hug me than shake my hand. Really? Yes. You'd rather, you'd rather for them to get that close. I, I'd rather because they hug me, their hands go around in my back. They're I, I hold my head away, and then they release, and that's it. Where my hand, I'm touching everything that they just touched, and yeah. it just freaks me out. You know, I'm just getting to that point, you know, that I right. just don't, and to touch him any hands, I'm, you know, because usually people are respectful. Yeah. The, I'll tell you, as a woman, though, it's not so much the hug, it's the guys who come around to the side yeah. and grab you around the shoulders. Mm. That's the ones you have to watch out for. You know, people who come in for a hug, they're usually, I, I, my experience, right. is they're usually a little bit more respectful and they truly do want their, the affection is sincere. Right. Where when guys grab you around the shoulders, it's <laughs> it's not necessarily sincere so much as, uh, hey, guess where you're going to stand? Right next to me. <laughs> you just need Rev standing near you during these. And Rev and has I more have. than once. Yes, I have. I have. I had a guy at work today, earlier today, tell me, like, uh, I figure you'll be like security at the Rev. I'm like, I get it a lot. Trust me. I get it a lot. So. Well, I play the role. I, I appreciate every role you play, Rev. Let yes. me let me say that. <laughs> I always feel safer when you're around. Not that you need to feel safe on these events. I mean, as far as like... No, but it's nice to know somebody's got your back. Kind of. Well, kind of I do, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Kind of I do. 
<laughs> no, I got your back yeah, for sure. Well, we love you, Rev. But yeah, those those meet and greets are so. I mean, as we found out, look at the Taylor Swift actually, you know, went to court over it with that yeah. guy. He lost yeah. his job. Yep. over it. That DJ or that this shock. The, the DJ, yeah. and it's basically his word against hers. Uh, but the jury believed her. Right. You know, so there must have been compelling evidence. Uh, yeah, but, I believe but, he's on the Supreme Court now. Yeah. So yeah, but but I really when the, you buy into those meet and greets backstage, be, just be prepared of what you're spending your money for. Right. Because yep. chances are you're going to get a few quick sec- seconds, a uh, quick picture, a couple of words at most. And then you're off. Smaller bands, the way to go. If you're going to do a meet and greet, that's right. Smaller bands. Yeah. They love Meet you. them on their way up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they love you. <laughs> they do. The, 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 the sound of.